Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Craig, and thank you for that kind introduction, and thank you for your warm welcome. Yesterday, in his second inaugural address, President Barack Obama quoted the Declaration of Independence, and he talked about unalienable rights. I would argue that his words make a mockery of both. I'd like to talk to you about one line near the end of President Obama's speech, where he said, quote, we cannot mistake absolutism for principle. Let me quote the president again. We cannot mistake absolutism for principle. So what is this absolutism the president attacks? And what are the so-called principles that he wants us to settle for instead? Obama wants to turn the idea of absolutism into a dirty word, just another word for extremism. He wants you, all of you, and Americans throughout all of this country to accept the idea of principles as he sees fit. It's a way of redefining words so that common sense is turned upside down and that nobody knows the difference. Think about it for just a minute. As families, when we're broke, and all of our credit cards are maxed out, we're all forced to tighten our belts. But when government is broke, and our bond rating is tumbling, and the president wants more new social programs, borrowing more money is supposed to be principled. And anybody who questions that is a no good absolutist, Obama code for extremist. We as gun owners face that same kind of false ultimatum. We're told that to stop and saying killers, we must accept less freedom, less than the criminal class, and the political elites, less than they keep for themselves. We're told that limits on magazine capacity or bans on 100-year-old firearm technology bans that only will affect lawful people, will somehow make us safer. We're told that wanting the same technology that the criminals and our elites are protected by for themselves is a form of absolutism, and that accepting less freedom and protection for ourselves is the only principled way to live. Barack Obama is saying that the only principled way to make children safe is to make lawful citizens less safe and violent criminals more safe. That's what it amounts to. Criminals couldn't care less about Barack Obama's so-called principles. They don't have principles. That's why they're called criminals. You all know that. Obama wants you to believe that putting the federal government right in the middle of every firearms transaction, except those between criminals, will somehow make us all safer. That means forcing law-abiding people to fork over excessive fees to exercise their rights, forcing parents to fill out forms to leave a family heirloom to a loved one's, standing in line and filling out a bunch of bureaucratic paperwork just so a grandfather can give a grandson a Christmas gift. He wants to put every private personal firearms transaction right under the thumb of the federal government. And he wants to keep all of those names in a massive federal registry. There's only two reasons for a federal list on gun owners, to either tax them or take them. It's the only reason. And anyone who says that's excessive, President Obama says, you're an absolutist. 
He doesn't understand you. He doesn't agree with the freedoms that all of you cherish, and Americans all over this great land cherish in their hearts. If the only way he can force you to give them up is through scorn and ridicule, believe me, he's more than willing to do it, even as he claims the moral high ground. He said it yesterday. In the very same sentence that Obama talked about absolutism versus principle, he also scolded his critics for name calling, as he called it. He's more than willing to demonize his opponents, silence his critics, and slur the NRA. In the words of Senator Charles Schumer, as an extremist fringe group. And look how he demonizes the Republicans in Congress. When Barack Obama says we cannot mistake absolutism for principle, what he's saying is that precision and clarity and exactness in language and law should be abandoned in favor of his nebulous, undefined principles. I've got news for the president. Absolutes do exist. Words do have specific meaning in language and in law. It's the basis of all civilization. It's why our laws are written down. So the letter of the law carries the force of the law. That's why our Bill of Rights was written into law to ensure that fundamental freedoms of a minority could never be denied by a majority. Those are the principles we call unalienable rights. Without those absolutes, without those protections, democracy decays into nothing more than two wolves and one lamb voting on, well, who to eat for lunch? <laughs> I urge our president to use caution when attacking clearly defined absolutes in favor of his principles. Mr. President, just because you wish words meant something other than what they mean, you don't have the right to define them any way you want. Because when words can mean anything, they mean nothing. When absolutes are abandoned for principles, the US Constitution becomes a blank slate for anyone's graffiti. And our rights and our freedoms are defaced. Words do have meaning, Mr. President. And those meanings are absolute, especially, especially when it comes to our Bill of Rights in this country. Don't take it from me. Take it from former Democratic U.S. Senator and U.S. Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black. Fifty years ago, after he had been appointed to the United States Supreme Court by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, liberal justice Hugo Black said, and I'm going to quote him right here for you. He said, there are absolutes in our Bill of Rights, and they were put there on purpose by men who knew what words meant and meant their prohibitions to be absolutes, end quote. Let me read you that quote again. There are absolutes in our Bill of Rights, and they were put there on purpose by men who knew what words meant and met their prohibitions to be absolutes. Justice Black understood the danger of self-appointed arbiters of what freedom really means, like President Obama, who wants to redefine freedom, whittle away freedom, and infringe upon the freedoms that we the people reserve for ourselves. They're God-given freedoms. They belong to us in the United States of America as our birthright. No government gave them to us, and no government can ever take them away. Ms. Mr. President, 
You may not like that. You may wish it were some other way. But you can't argue that it isn't true. In that, the American people are and always remain utterly absolute. We are not people to be trivialized, marginalized, or demonized as unreasonable. We're not children who need to be parented or misguided, bitter clingers to guns and religion. We get up, and people just like all of you in this room all over this country get up every day. We work hard to pay our taxes. We cherish our families. We care about their safety. We believe in living honorably and living within our means. We believe we deserve and have every right to the same level of freedom that our government leaders keep for themselves and the same capabilities and the same technologies that criminals use to prey upon us and our families. That means we believe in our right to defend ourselves and our families with semi-automatic firearms technology. We believe that if neither the criminal nor the political class and their bodyguards and security people are limited by magazine capacity, we shouldn't be limited in our capacity either. We believe in our country. We believe in our Bill of Rights. And we believe in our Second Amendment to the United States Constitution, all of our Second Amendment. Because we believe in the freedom and the safety and that it, and it alone, guarantees absolutely our freedom and our safety. Mr. President, you might think calling us absolutists is a clever way of name calling without using names. But if that is absolutist, then we are as absolutist as our founding fathers and the framers of our United States Constitution and we are proud of it. Thank you very much. Thank you.